Hi, my name's Tony Boyd from the Financial Review and um, I have the privilege today of hosting the Future Generation Investment Forum virtual meeting with three legends from Australian Funds Management. Um, and don't uh, take anything out of this uh, in terms of the way I introduce them. It's just alphabetical order. We'll start with Phil King from Regal, uh, David Paradise from Paradise Investments and Jeff Wilson from Wilson Asset Management. And um, I can't think of a, a better group of people to inform us about what's happening in financial markets. So before I start to ask the questions, I'll just tell you what came out of a survey of future generation investors. And they were asked their own attitude to the markets. Were they bullish, were they bearish, or were they neutral? And uh, so before I ask our uh, panelists, their own answer to that question. I'll just tell you the results. 15% um, said they were bullish, 32% said they were bearish, and 53% were sitting on the fence. Uh, I don't expect our guests to be sitting on the fence. So why don't we start with you, Phil? Um, what what would your answers be, answer be to that question? I'm more bearish than I normally am. I think we've seen a bit of a relief rally in the market, but um, certainly we're facing one of the deepest economic recessions that we've seen for a long, long time. And so I think it's tough to see the stock market doing too well in that environment. Well, thank you. That was, uh, that was quite succinct. Um, Para, uh, would you like to come in there? And I believe you're sitting in America. You're, you're in the, uh, the biggest uh, economy in the world there, which is, obviously wonderfully managed by a, um, a Republican president, but uh, what's your uh, uh, answer to the questions? Well, uh, say in, in March, I felt that things may turn up for the better when the cases started declining um, in Australia. And I felt that at about that time that America would be just starting to go up. And so I felt that the, Aussie market would start moving up and I thought the currency would get stronger um, and uh, that was when it was the kind of late 50s, um, you know, 64 and a half, 65 at the moment. And I thought the US market would um, have a significant decline. But what's happened is uh, the Australian market has got stronger and the US market uh, and the currency has got stronger and the US market has also got stronger. And uh, you know, there's a lot of people saying, well, in Australia, the um, uh, stimulus is, say, after GFC, it was about 6% of GDP. This time, it's about 12% of GDP. So there's this massive stimulus going into uh, the economy, which should help go through, you know, they're all, everybody's talking about, is it V or is it U? That's the question that everybody um, is trying to work out. Um, and uh, I'm a bit like Phil that, that I think things have uh, rocketed up way too much. And I suppose, you know, there's a whole lot of things when, you, when you're thinking about it, you think about, um, uh, well, people will be, you know, the, the, the lockdown will be thawed out, but then are people really going to go out and start buying, you know, even though they've got this in the pocket? And that's the big question, it's human nature. But then, of course, people generally are bullish, and that's why you're seeing this uptick in the equity market and uh, why people are kind of looking through the V and thinking, well, it's only going to be a, a kind of sharp V down and then a sharp, a sharp uh, uptick. Uh, but I, I'm kind of with, with Phil now after you've seen a big increase in the equity market. Now you've got valuation. I mean, you've got interest rates that obviously aren't going very, very high. They're probably close to 0 or 1%. And so that will, um, you, you've got that certainty and that's good for the kind of growth stocks and all that kind of stuff. But then what happened, if you look back at the equity market prior to the, to the COVID thing back in February, um, January, February, the equity market was quite expensive. People said it's quite expensive. Well, now it's back up to that level, but you've had this massive contraction in the economy. And so it's probably even more expensive. You know, but the equity market continues to go up. So, in short, I'm probably where Phil is. Um, I'm a bit bearish. Okay. Well, um, I noticed uh, in your latest uh, report to your investors, uh, Jeff, you said, uh, you know, we've just come out of the fastest bear market in history. 
And I think that's been followed by, as, uh, as Power has said, one of the fastest recoveries in history, back to those, uh, those very expensive PEs. What's your, uh, what's your feeling at the moment? Are you, uh, you bullish or bearish? The, well, well the, thank you, Tony. And, and the incredible thing is that we've had the longest bull market ever um, yeah, that finished you know, the early part of this year. And, and, and as you said, you know, we've had the you know, most severe or most brutal bear market. Um, and obviously, you know, as, as Phil and, uh, and David were saying, is you know, the incredible liquidity that's been pumped into the system, both from a fiscal perspective and from a monetary perspective, has, has allowed valuations to bounce back up. I think if we're all sitting here and, and the market was sort of 20 to 25% lower, I think as investors, you know, all of us would be a lot more comfortable um, yeah, so, and, and Paris talking about, you know, is it a, is it a V shape, you know, the economic recovery or is it, is it going to be a, a U shape recovery? Well, you, you wonder whether you put a, you know, it could be an L they're talking about and it could be a W, you know, so, <laughs> um, and, uh, and to me, that's the great uncertainty. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think obviously valuation has been pushed up because of that liquidity. And that does make me nervous. So I'd be, I'd be tending on, on the bearish side. Well, thank you. Um, but uh, that's a pretty, pretty unanimous decision, to sort of group of people there being pretty bearish. But uh, let me move to the second question, what the investors were asked. Where do you see the best buying opportunities at the moment? Is it Australian equities? And 65% of investors said yes to that. Or is it global equities? And only 35% said that. What I find intriguing is that as I go through the performance of your funds over the recent period, in the March quarter, for example, I think it's fair to say that all of your funds that were international that you manage outperformed the indexes or benchmarks as opposed to your Australian funds, which is an interesting dichotomy there. Maybe if uh, we'd start with you, Jeff, um, is there better opportunity offshore uh, at the moment, or is it actually in Australia? The, I mean, in terms of setting your portfolio, you've got to set your portfolio for sort of whether, whether it's, you know, they call it the new normal or, 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 the, or the changed economic conditions we're in. I mean, one of the great things about looking at global equities and Katrina, who runs our global fund, uh, has, has been talking about it numerously. You can get a lot of these plays, you know, whether you know, the big changes in the economy, the cashless society, um, you know, the big growth in e-commerce, um, you know, telehealth, et cetera, you can get really good direct plays looking globally uh, um, in terms of, and, and, and you can't necessarily get those great direct plays here in Australia looking for uh, companies to invest to get that, those type of exposures. So to me, you've got a, you've got a lot better selection you know, from a, a global perspective in terms of broadly, yeah, you know, which economy is will do well you know, over the next period? You'd have to say Australia is in a, a fantastic position. Now, in in theory, um, you know, this is what everywhere else in the world would like to be like. I think at, at this point in time, in terms of how you know, everyone's been, you know, how how Australia's been so successful in terms of you know, getting that, you know, flattening the curve or or you know, getting the virus under control, which is allowing us, you know, will allow us to you know, benefit significantly. And internally, we were talking about the other day, you, know, you, you could get, you know, in theory, a lot of, you'd get a lot of people wanting to come and live in Australia. Um, and you know, could there be some big you know, financial benefit um, you know, from the Australian government by opening it up? Now, obviously, you know, politically, the problem is that they probably won't do that. Um, but yeah, I, I think I think as an economy, I think Australia will do um, you know, reasonably well. You know, the domestic economy over the next period of time, and where you know, whether the US or the UK, I, I think you know, they're going to find it. It's going to be a lot tougher over the next little period. Great. Well, um, Para, you're uh, you're sitting there in America at the moment. Uh, are there better opportunities over there than uh, there are in Australia? Do you think? Uh, I, I, I agree with Jeff. I think that the Australian economy should do okay or better. Um, America, as we all know, take, has taken a long time to address the issues that are happening. 
Um, it is interesting though that uh, we have an emerging markets fund based out of San Francisco. And I think the Australian equity market financially year to date was down 15%. Um, but their benchmark, which is the emerging be market benchmark, was down 5%. They're actually, they're actually up positive 5%, so they're outperforming by 10%. But they have actually been able to do that because they have a, had investments in China and obviously China ha has not affected as much, but there are some areas like Brazil and South Africa which have been built it. So there are, I mean, it's hard to say a blanket, you know, well, we should be going and buy, you know, Australia's better than that. But there are some, you know, some of those massive stocks in, in America, the the uh, Amazons and, and the Googles and those kind of things are benefiting in some respects from this particular COVID crisis. So there are good stocks there and there are good stocks. I, I, look, I don't know whether they're good quality or whether they're good value or they're worth buying or not, but I'm just saying that, that, that there are pockets of good stocks around the world. And it, it would seem that even in the emerging markets where, where um, our San Francisco guys are investing, they've done a fantastic job finding value there. So you can find value. It's just um, trying to work out where it is. Thank you. Well, uh, Phil, uh, I, I get the feeling there's a bit of a thematic coming out of uh, our two other guests there that uh, you really want to find the themes that are going to work and don't discriminate between offshore and onshore. Is that, is that am I getting it right or what's your attitude? I think that's exactly right. I think actually sector exposure is much more important at the moment than country exposure. The Australian market underperformed in the bull market and we've underperformed this year in the bear market. And sadly, I think we're probably going to underperform going forward. And that's more about the composition of our market than anything else. The Australian market has a big exposure to stocks that look cheap through leverage, value traps like banks and REITs and infrastructure. And we've got a big exposure to some incumbents like Telstra and supermarkets that are losing share to, to newer entrants. Whereas many of the overseas markets have much higher weighting in healthcare and higher weightings in technology. And these two sectors are the two sectors that we think will do best in the current environment. They've got less exposure to the um, economy and a lot of the stocks in these sectors have much stronger balance sheets, which is more important than ever before. So I think it's much more important to think about your sec sector exposures. And we like technology, we like healthcare, and we like gold as well. Um, rather than worrying about uh, country exposures. And I think sadly, the Australian market could continue to underperform just because of those, that composition that we have in the market. Well, thank you, um, Phil. And just while I've got you, um, obviously you had a pretty tough uh, March quarter, uh, March and April. And, and it'd be just interesting to get your perspective because uh, you know, whenever I've asked people about this, and, and I think the Atlantic Absolute Return Fund uh, was down 58% in March and 32% in February. But if you look at that fund, it was up 82% last year. I mean, it's, it's actually probably still in front. I mean, um, and I think since inception, it's been uh, extraordinary. What, what, what have you been saying to your investors uh, as they've read that March uh, note you put out? Yeah, the good news is most of our investors have been with us for a long time. We've made them a lot of money and we've actually seen investors tend to add more rather than take money away. So, you know, the Atlantic Fund is a high conviction fund. We use leverage, we invest in small caps. Um, and so, you know, when there is a change in direction in the market, it can catch us a little bit unawares. And we did probably underestimate the impact of the coronavirus pandemic initially. Um, but then, you know, you know, the good news is that we can bounce back. And, you know, we bounced back strongly after the GFC. We were up 500% in, in the two years after 08. And, you know, early signs in April and May are very positive. We're having two very strong months. Uh, one of the things that hurt us in March was the fact that we do have a lot of small and mid-cap exposure. We like the technology sector. We like the pharma sector. Um, but the price, you know, a lot of these stocks that we like in Australia are at the small and mid-cap end. And as a result, a lot of these stocks got sold off a little bit more than the broader market. You know, stocks like Telstra and supermarkets uh, obviously had some short-term benefits from the pandemic, but we think will struggle for growth in the longer term. 
Um, but the good news is that a lot of the stocks that got sold off in the sell-off have bounced back very strongly and some of them are back to where they were and some of them are even ahead. So yeah, look, our investors are, are very loyal and yeah, fortunately they've been with us for a long time and um, they understand what we're trying to achieve in the Atlantic Fund. Jeff, if I could turn to you, uh, you know, I was your flagship fund, of course, is WAM Leaders, eight hundred million dollar fund, uh, gross assets. Uh, uh, WAM Capital is the flag flagship. WAM Leaders is yeah, is is our leaders fund. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, WAM Capital is a billion dollars. So, uh, <laughs> um, yeah. but look, I, I just the, the thing that caught my eye in the WAM Leaders uh, letter that you sent to your investors was when that sell off happened in February you moved really fast. Um, you basically got into consumer discretionary real estate infrastructure and, um, sorry, you removed the, the companies with cyclical and leveraged characteristics. And then you, you bought gold stocks, Woolies, Coles, Amcor, um, all of which have done very well. Can you just tell us, um, I think a lot of people just buy and hold is this something you should leave for the fund managers or should you yourself follow their lead and, and be uh, more active in your um, management of your assets? Yeah. I, I, think, I think when you look at you know, whether David or, or Phil's or ourselves, in, in this period of time that we're in, yeah, um, you'll see the active managers outperforming. And, and I, I think you look at, you know, if you, um, you know, say, in six months time, you look back and you'll see all of them uh, do well because uh, unfortunately the passive play just gives you the index. Uh, and, and as you know, Phil said very articulately, uh, um, you look at the Australian index and it is you know, very exposed to you know, financials, REITs uh, and, and some sort of old world companies. Uh, and, and really, in the next six to twelve months, where do you want to be exposed? You know, you, you, you obviously want high quality companies. You want liquidities, you know, good balance sheets, um, and, and you want companies that can grow. So, you know, the you were talking about you know Wham Leaders, Matt Helped, who's the lead PM there. Yeah, you know, he's done a fantastic job of you know, adjusting to the changing environment. Um, and yeah, you know, which which sort of happened, yeah, you know, late February, and I think for the period, yeah, you know, he's outperformed the market. I think by, I think it could be, it could be eight or nine percent, um, yeah, you know, because of that, because of the rotation. Where in in our flagship fund in Wham Capital, yeah, you know, that's more mids and smalls. Where, yeah, you know, because the economic environment had changed, yeah, you know, from the twenty fourth of February when it was clear that it was um, that COVID was going to, yeah, you know, was sort of taking, uh, impacting the world rather than just China. Um, yeah, it, it, we, you know, we realised that it was a risk off play and, and also that we had to, that it was going to be a new, um, you know, the outlook for the economy was going to be different. Um, and so we actually went to 43% cash in, a, in the mid and small cap fund uh, because it also, yeah, and we remembered back in the GFC, yeah, you know, the during these tougher periods, you usually find companies raise a lot of equity, uh, and I think the equivalent of twelve percent of the equity of uh, the market cap was raised in new equity during the GFC. So we assumed it was going to be twelve percent plus, uh, and w and we've used that opportunity in in more of the mid and small cap funds is to you know, a, a reposition our portfolios, which I think we all did. You know, the, the tough thing is in and you know re re talking about Phil's comments. It, um, or, you know, Tony, your comment about Phil uh, is performance is when, when, when you get hit you know, with a bear market or, or a major market drawdown, like all fund managers are going to get impacted. The question is how you restructure your portfolio and how you position yourself and really how quickly you make your money back. And as Phil pointed out, you know, you know, volatility is just part of investing in equities and it depends which ones you invest in. Um, but it's really how quickly you make your money back. And, you know, Phil pointed out he, he made it back very quickly and after the GFC, you know, you made five times your money by being in that fund. And I know from our perspective is, you know, after the GFC, it took us um, a little over two and a bit years to get back to the, 
the height again. And I think the market took six and a half or something like that. So it's really, the, to me, the, you know, whether you, the, the, the sort of the looking at, you know, who's a good fund manager or not, it's really not the fact that you'll lose some money, you know, when there's major uh, market dislocation. It's really how quickly you can make that money back. That's the crux. Just a quick follow up there, Jeff. Um, it would strike me that one of the keys to your success in funds management has been frank dividends and your uh, laser like focus on making sure you're giving people a distribution that is fully franked. How are you thinking about that at the moment when you've got so many companies either deferring or slashing or stopping their dividends um, because of COVID? Yeah, the, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily agree. I, I know frank dividends have been very topical over the last couple of years because of Labor's, uh, unfortunately, uh, illogical, inequitable uh, proposed policy. Um, the, I mean, what we're trying to do is probably like all fund managers, we're trying to buy undervalued growth companies and buy them when we can see a catalyst that's going to change the valuation. That's our focus. And, and our ability to pay... Um, you know, fully frank dividends to our shareholders in our LICs is, is really the, the function of us making capital and paying tax. Um, so even though companies are going to be, you know, there'll be a lot of dividends, you know, companies cutting dividends, you know, how we you know, get most of the dividends we pay is by making money and paying tax and paying the dividend out. And the great thing is about, well, with the listed investment company structure is you can smooth those dividends over time. So um, it really, for us, it's a function of how much profit reserve we've got, how much franking we've got, um, and our ability to keep paying those dividends. So, yeah, that's, yeah, we think we can continue to pay them. Um, and that, that's really a function of us making capital profit and paying tax on it, rather than getting dividends from the companies that come in. And there's no doubt, you know, what, what I love is how you know, a lot of the bigger companies are talking about um, deferring dividends. Uh, to me, isn't that just a polite way of saying, I'm, I'm cutting this dividend, you're not going to get it. And you, you, you just get the other, you know, the dividend in six months time. I'm not sure if, if they're real deferrals or not, but I, I like the new, the new verbiage that everyone's using. Yeah, actually, that's the way I looked at it too. So Para, um, Jeff mentioned the amount of capital raisings and potentially the opportunities there. Have you been... Uh... Uh, involved in that? Have you been taking up new equity issues, secondary market issues? Uh, yes, we have. Um, we have been taking up some of the issues. And, and I think, um, like we've all touched on, right, <clears throat> right at the moment, it's pretty important to be um, have a lot of downside protection in the portfolio, is to try and um, buy particular investments or whatever it is where there is limited downside but of course it's it's hard you you, you know you know that say for example flight center rose rose uh, raised some money the other day to allow them to be able to trade for you know i can't remember what the period of time was but who knows how long this that's the question is that how long is this thing going to to go for you know and you have to um as all of us have done is is move or all of our fund managers have done is move uh, the portfolios to a place where there is limited downside protection and uh, not taking on too much risk because you don't know what the upside is from here. You know, you, you don't know how much uh, unemployment is going to be and how things have been structurally changed by this, you know, whether people are going to work more from home and is that going to affect the office, the office market and REITs and all that kind of stuff. So look, it's, it's a, it's a tough time. But, uh, but the capital raisings, uh, uh, have they, Para, have they actually been at good discounts and, and attractive terms? Um, I don't, uh, I, I generally, yes, they have been. Um, and the stocks have sometimes traded down to those levels subsequent to that after um, people have taken the stock and then sold it. But um, I don't know, Phil and Jeff, do you know what the discounts have been? I don't know. Yeah, they've been pretty, I mean, I think the, they're at least 9% discounts. Uh, and I remember there's some data a week or two ago that was sort of like 97% of them you'd made money on. Uh, because the early ones that were raising were really, as Paris said, you know, it was the flight centres, the web jets, 
the ones that a lot of people thought wouldn't survive. So there was a lot of negative uh, sentiment um, that overlaid on the on those stocks. And so when they when they raised the money, you know, they not they, there was quite a strong bounce in terms of you know those type of companies. Yeah. And I think the other thing to add is that most of the companies that have been raising have been raising in a rising market. And so obviously they work a lot better. It's a lot more difficult to raise money when the market's falling. Um, and that's why we sometimes might need to see wider discounts in a falling market than a rising market. Well, gentlemen, we've got about 10 minutes left. So I thought maybe we could start with you, Phil. Um, it's always good, I think, for the investors to, to hear about some stocks that you think are going to do well in the current environment. I, I assume you're going to talk about defensive stocks, but maybe, please, uh, if you could tell us your a couple of stocks that you think at the moment offer very good uh, opportunities to invest. Yeah, we like uh, you know three sectors at the moment. We like uh, technology. We like, we like healthcare, and we like gold. Um, in the in the tech sector, we like stocks like uh, Next DC and Megaport, both involved in data centres. We like Appen, which has got you know one of the biggest crowds working from home, and has got customers that are, are doing very well in this environment. Um, in the uh, healthcare sector, we like stocks like you know Optia, which has got had some very successful results um, in the treatment of macular degeneration. And so that's a very exciting company. And we think eventually that'll get taken over by a global, global um, healthcare company for two or three times the current share price. That's Optia. Um, and we also like the gold sector. You know, one of our gold stocks, DeGray, has found what we think could be one of the biggest gold discoveries in Australia for, for many, many decades. Um, that's at the smaller end of the market. At the larger end of the market or the mid cap end of the market, we like Red Five. We think that's undervalued. And we also like stocks like Saracen. So, gold, technology, and healthcare, they're the three sectors that we really like at the moment. It sounds very good. Um, and, and they do tend to be uh, small, smaller to mid cap stocks, don't they? So, you've got greater what leverage? Greater leverage, yeah, obviously coming with a little bit more risk as well. And that's what we saw in February and March. But certainly, you know, in this Australian market, we don't see a lot of growth. And so I think it's important to go down the curve a little bit in terms of market cap and try and invest in some of those small and mid caps. Well, maybe that's a good segue to Para. Um, I think in your latest uh, report, your mid cap and small cap funds both outperformed their benchmarks. Um, in the March quarter, what, what would you uh, what would you tell the audience about the stocks you like at the moment? Um, well, so some of the stocks. So as with Phil, um, you know we're quite keen on gold, and if you think through um, the implications of all this money going being pumped into the system, it could have inflationary uh, uh, implications sometime down the track. But gold is a, an area that we like, and as a result. We also are very keen on, on Saracen. They've got fantastic management. Um, we also like Sigma because of the, the management. They've, they've had a rough crop, but the sales for the last uh, half were up around about 30%, and they've been benefiting from um, uh, the of this COVID uh, related stuff. But the, the management there are, are, are fantastic, and we believe that. Um, um, you know, they've had a rough trot of, of late, but we think that they'll turn things around. And we think by about 2022, um, that their uh, EBITDA numbers should be much higher than what they are at the moment. And of course, everybody, it's expensive stock, but everybody loves um, CSL. I mean, all these these three companies are very well managed and, and CSL is is a, uh, a great business, very well managed, but of course it's very expensive. But we do think it's a global leader in buzz blood plasma products and also, you know, it should be able to assist in vaccine production and things like that. So yeah, those are the three of the stocks we like. Sounds good. Well, uh, I think we're getting a sort of Saracen moment here. Um, Jeff, I believe that Saracen's in the uh, WAM Leaders Fund. I mean, what, <laughs> any other stocks you'd name or? Uh, well, in terms of, you know, the companies you want to own coming out of this is actually uh, well managed, uh, um, good balance sheets, you know, well positioned. Um, if you're talking more sort of 
you know, looking at domestic equities in Australia, more short to medium term, you'd probably go for some of the deep cyclicals, only because they've been beaten up uh, a lot. And also the fact that, you know, it appears that Australia is doing exceptionally well and, and we're coming out of COVID. So, you know, our, our, you know, maybe everyone's got a bit too negative for that. But in terms of, you know, the ones that we like medium long term uh, and, and looking at, you know, looking at sort of mid and small companies that can, you know, that have good franchises that can grow, um, you know, things like Infomedia, you know, Bapcorp, um, you, know, um, you know, John Ling, you know, companies, companies like Objective, you know, companies like that that have a, you know, some competitive um, you know, advantage and can, you know, can prosper in sort of all different types of economic conditions. I know we've all, we're all talking about sort of being, you know, you know, a bit nervous over the next, you know, say three to six months, but I, I think it's fair to put it in context. And one of the great things about the equity market is it, it performs over time. Um, and, you know, you really want to be buying when, you know, when, when everyone's a little bit on the nervous side, because you know that at some point in time, everyone will be incredibly bullish again. Um, and if you can take sort of that medium term view, and I think, you know, I mean, David, Phil, myself and, and yourself, you know, would all agree that at some point in time, um, we'll look back at this period uh, and it really, um, you know, it'll be like sort of reminiscing as, as David did about the 87 crash or reminiscing about, um, about the tech wreck or you know, reminiscing about the GFC. Um, and you know, so, so life will go back to normal. Um, uh, yeah, whether it's the new normal, but but it will be a normal, and and um, and we'll be and we'll be talking about you know, these great bull markets again. Well, that sounds like a very good note to end the discussion on. Seeing we all started being bearish, and now we're talking about the next bull market. That's great. Okay. Well, look. Uh, thank you, everybody, for participating in the panel, and. Um, just before we go, though, there was one other question that was asked of the uh, uh, investors, and that was, do you still believe mental health is the issue of our time? And it's interesting that um, the answer to that was, yes, 73% of people still believe that. So uh, that's, a, uh, that's a very good thing, isn't it? When you think that the whole purpose of the future generation a concept is is to help people who've got mental health issues. So uh, we appreciate your time in in in, in this and, and your efforts to donate your uh, funds management earnings to this cause. So thank you.